As we turn to study oligopoly, we introduce the tool of, of game theory. And the reason we, we do this is that we need a tool that can help us analyze situations where strategic interactions among players uh, is, is central to the analysis. So the key here is that strategic... interaction is central, just to uh, write that down. Um, when you think about it, we, we've been studying com competitive firms and monopoly firms. And, and competitive firms, they're price takers. They just take whatever the market price does. They can sell all they want at that price. They can't raise price. They can't lower price. They, their decisions are really independent at the at at a fundamental level of what their rivals are doing, um, that changes a bit with monopolistic competition. But but um, we we sort of wave our hands at that uh, as we well we have some tools to talk about how how firms might place their product in in terms of product characteristics or location. But um, that those those tools are, are a little bit get get at strategy a little bit, but but not enough to really uh, nail the problem of oligopoly. A monopoly, there was only one firm in monopoly, so there we didn't need to think about the in interaction between the monopolist and any other firm. But, but now when we, when we have oligopoly, we have a situation where um, there are few firms that are, are very acutely aware of what each other is doing. So oligopoly. Uh, a few firms deciding. We, we generally think of them deciding on uh, price and output. We could, we, there are definitely models where we think of them um, thinking about plant capacity, product characteristics, etc. The, the, the tool of game theory is actually quite flexible. Uh, but for, the, for simple models, we generally uh, think about these firms Deciding on price and quantity, um, uh, with an awareness uh, of other firms' behavior, that's one way to put it. Um, and and anyway, that that's the key, the key to the. Uh, the, why we need this. As we uh, use, as we develop our understanding of game theory, let's let's talk first about what the elements of a game are. Uh, and the key here is is the elements are players. Who's in the game? I mean, in the simplest form, we we are going to see a lot of two player games, and and sometimes we'll we'll. Um, use a format where we get to n player games where, where one player is one person and the other player will call everybody else. So we, we, we can get even in a two player model into a n player game, but, but typically we're just going to have two, not that we couldn't have three or four or five or, or whatever, but um, the, two, the two player games get at a lot of what we need to, what we need to examine. And that's where we'll focus at this introductory level. Uh, the other uh, elements of a game, or the strategies, and, and the strategy is just what uh, game theorists have called this. It's actually a misnomer. Um, a possible actions is a, is a better way to put it. But everybody else says strategies, so I, I use that term uh, too. Um, so, so here, if if two firms are are playing the game. We, we generally think of strategy, strategies, possible actions. Well, one could price high or one could price low. You know, that would be a, a fairly simplified way to think about pricing. Build big plant, build small plant, it, you know, that, that kind of thing. Uh, and, we, and we're definitely simplifying because in, in choosing a price, you could choose 100, 99, 98, whatever, you know. And so we're just going to uh, narrow those strategies down to a, to a more manageable Number at at higher levels, there's there's you know strategies that uh, there's approaches to game theory that would let us um, a analyze things a little more complexly. But 
But at, at, at our intro level, it's actually a really simple but very, very powerful framework, which is really nice, where we, where we can use a straightforward framework to get at very complex questions. At, at the graduate school level, game theory can get you into the, the messiest math of anything out there in economics. So, so it, can, it can get much more complicated than, than we're going to analyze uh, and then finally, you need to articulate to study a game uh, the the payoffs, and this is just uh, the, the payoffs we we articulate as we study a game. We articulate the payoffs to all possible combinations of strategies on all the parts of of the players. So that that's what a a game is about. And we, we use an abbreviated form to analyze games uh, that, that where both players take their actions, employ their strategies at the same time. We call these simultaneous games. And the key here is that both players take their, their actions not knowing what the other player is going to do or has done. Um, in, in a future screencast, I'll talk about sequential games where, where the timing matters. Um, anyway, I li I, I've prepared here a, a fairly simple um, payoff matrix for, for a game. It's, it's part of a family of games we call dating games. So let's just use a dating game example. And I'm going to reverse some usual um, gender stereotypes, and I hope that doesn't confuse you, but here we go. So let's say there are two players. we got to articulate our players. Let's say they're Joe and Sheila. And so that, that's the two players in the game. And let, let's say they're going to go to a movie theater, and um, let's say they're separated in the dark hallway, and they can't see uh, where where they each other is. Um, there's two possible movies. It's a small cineplex. Let's say there's an action movie. I'm just going to call it an action flick. I don't know if people still call movies flicks. And then uh, let's say there's a, rom a romantic comedy showing, and I'm just going to call that a rom-com. And Sheila faces the same two uh, decisions. They they went into the restrooms, men's and the women's restroom at different time, or at the same time they come out. Lights are off. They got to figure out which which uh, movie to enter. Uh, and Sheila can go to the action flick, or she can go to the rom com. And so, so this is their possible actions. They go to one movie or go to the other. Now, uh, so we've got the players, we've got the strategies or possible actions. Now let's get to the payoffs. And here's how we do it. We, we draw a grid. You've probably noticed my penchant for tables already. Anyway, the, this table is going to uh, talk about the payoffs in, in a particular way. And I'm, I'm going to draw... Just tell the the uh, who is ever looking at this game that my payoffs are going to go uh, Joe, then Sheila. So I'm going to have two numbers in each grid, and that's going to be the payoff to Joe, comma payoff uh, to Sheila. So so this first cell is is what's going to happen if they're both at the action flick. And and here's here let's I'm going to use a different convention. I'm going to use a convention of just you know, using one, two, three, four for the payoffs. One is worst, four is best. It, it, it gets a little bit confusing because sometimes people use one as the best and four as the worst, or, or, the, or a lot of times we'll be using payoffs of seven million and 300,000, whatever. So, um, the, the key feature of, of these games, the, analyzing the games, though, is, is is one payoff better than the other. So a one, two, three, four um, articulation of payoffs uh, gets us where we need to be, and it's in a, in a simple way. So I'm going to say if they're at the action flick, flick, the payoff to Joe is three, the payoff to Sheila is four. And and this is called a dating game, and, and dating games are ones where um, the players would rather be together than apart, uh, so, so they both have relatively high payoffs. 
Sheila, in my example, likes the action flicks. Uh, Joe is a is a romantic, uh, sort of sensitive male of the 21st century, and he prefers the rom-com. So um, if they both end up in the rom-com, Joe gets his highest outcome. He's both with Sheila and at his preferred movie. Uh, Sheila has got to go to the rom-com instead of the action flick, but she she just wants to be with Joe most of all. So um, uh, we're going to give her her payoff is three, his is four. Um, if, let's say, Joe goes to the action flick and she lines up in the rom-com, well, th- this is uh, 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 now each is in their less preferred um, outcome, and we're going to call the payoffs there one comma one. And then if Sheila goes to the action flick and Joe goes to the rom-com, they're apart, but at least each is in their preferred movie. So that's that's the payoff matrix, and uh, this is a very common um, uh, common uh, set of practices, both to, to list the payoffs, uh, Joe comma Sheila, in my next screencast, I'll show you a different convention, and also then to use the one, two, three, four uh, as the payoffs, just to get a ranking rather than put, you know, utilities or whatever, or some 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 cardinal measure or something. So, so that's what we've done. Um, there's one more concept I want to get across before um, we we finish here. Let's talk just simply about a Nash equilibrium, and one of the first problems as as economists and mathematicians embraced or developed the tools of game theory. There was a long time where they had some of the tools, but they didn't have an, a concept of equilibrium. And then this guy Nash, they they made a made a movie of him, A Beautiful Mind. This Princeton math professor um, developed this notion of equilibrium. And a Nash equilibrium is where no player has an incentive to change his or her strategy, given what all other players have done. Now, this takes a little bit of getting used to 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 um, apply. So let's just think here. Let's let's analyze. I'll use a different color, uh, blue. I guess is, is is a nice color. Let's let's investigate whether this is a, a Nash equilibrium. Let's just go cell by cell. Uh, this is um, let's let's get this first cell. Sheila's gone to an action flick. Joe's gone to an action flick. Given that Sheila has gone to an action flick. Would Joe like to change his strategy to going to a rom-com? Well, let's see. He, he's he got to pay off a three if he stays in the action uh, movie. His, his payoff will go down to two, so he's happy where he is. Likewise, given that Joe has gone to the action flick, would Sheila rather go to this rom-com? Well, let's think. Given that Joe is in the action flick, Sheila's payoff is four. If she went over to the rom-com, her payoff would fall to one. So neither player has an incentive to change their uh, strategy given what the other. So this is, we'll put a check mark. That is a Nash equilibrium, a check mark and a Nash. Well, let's let's just go uh, along. Let's say, say they're both, uh, well, uh, Joe's at the action flick. That's what this cell is. Joe is at the action flick. Sheila's at the rom-com. Uh, given that Joe's at the action flick, would Sheila have an incentive to change her action? Well, yeah, if she did, her payoff would go from one to four. So this is not a Nash equilibrium. All you have to do is find one uh, player that wants to change their action, given what the other players have done, and it's not. Well, that same reasoning disqualifies this one the, um, as, as a Nash equilibrium. Uh, however, this game does feature two Nash equilibria, if they both go to the rom-com, neither one has an incentive to change their action, and um, I'll leave you to verify that. And, and realize that games might have zero Nash equilibria. Um, they might have two. They, they, you know, there, there isn't, um, there isn't just one Nash equilibrium to every game. Although we'll, we'll talk about Prisoner's Dilemma, where, where there is just one Nash equilibrium. Made with DoodleCast Pro.